the yes, yeah. I, yeah, I'm gonna have to try. I'm gonna have to try that. I heard Filipino food was really good. Do you eat any of it out there? Yeah, I just just got finished eating some. Yeah. What was it? What you ate? Uh it's this thing. I forgot what it's called, but it's basically string beans. They they mm -hmm. eat. It's basically their food is basically soul food with a different name. Really? I think they got like a different plant, and I'm like, that's collard greens. And then they're like, <laughs> you know, they got this different plant, and I'm like, that's string beans. And they're like, yeah. what are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> nah, their food. Yeah. They got this. Uh, they got this other food. And I'm like, man, that's that's sweet potato pie. And they're like, that's cassava. And I'm like, that's sweet potato pie. <laughs> I love y'all. So hey, we're gonna go. <laughs> get started every the attendees are already coming in um so let's get started so everybody thank you so much for tuning in this is the final series the final webinar of the series black food entrepreneurship so thank you so much for rocking with the food truck scholar and eat okra we really do appreciate it make sure you download the eat okra app because if you haven't what are you waiting on go ahead Make sure you download it. This is going to be the place that you need to be. Thank, thank you, Fred. See, see, you need to get like Fred. Download Eat Okra app so you can find Black restaurants and food trucks near you. So once again, thank you so much. I am Ariel Smith. I am the executive producer and host of the Food Truck Scholar podcast, where we talk about any and everything related to the food truck industry. So as you already know, this series is about the lessons learned in the first year of food trucking. We know that food trucks are huge, they're taking over, and in the midst of Auntie Rona, they're probably the best model you can have. So I brought with me three experts from all over and internationally who are going to share their expertise on what's it like being a food truck owner. So I am going to start actually with my... I guess my left, your right, all the way from Manila, Philippines. Fred, how you doing? Hi. Hey, guys. I'm, I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm Fred from Maryland Chicken, and we are a soul food restaurant, the only soul food restaurant, um, if you don't count Popeyes, in Manila, Philippines. So uh, I'm out here in Manila, and I started um, making my, well, my, my wife started making my grandma's food. She learned my grandma's food. And um, she liked it so much, she would make it for me so I wouldn't be homesick. And her friends tried it. And it was the first time they'd ever tried soul food. So they started saying, oh, we should make a restaurant. We should make a restaurant. It's exotic food from this exotic place called Landover, Maryland. We should make you know, a, a restaurant for exotic Landover, Maryland food. And I said, no one's going to buy my grandma's Maryland chicken. They called it Maryland chicken. And now I uh, co-own Maryland chicken. So we do events. Out here in the Philippines, we have a full soul food um, uh, menu. But over time, over the past like three years, it's gone from soul food to soul food slash Filipino food fusion. And that had to do with us, you know, modifying our recipes to meet the market, which was a, was a learning experience. And at the end of that fusion, we created one of the weirdest things on our menu, which is my grandma's deep fried watermelon from Mississippi, which is normally on a stick. And we turned it into deep fried watermelon done Filipino quick, quick style, where you make it into little balls and deep fry it. So now when we do events in the US, I didn't want to bring soul food from Landover, Maryland back to Landover, Maryland, in the DC area. I wanted to bring the craziest thing that nobody's heard about because it's a meat in the middle. So we do. So in the US, we're called hashtag deep fried watermelon. Eat okra, do you have anybody else on your app that has deep fried watermelon on the list? You're muted. That sounds so good. Like, no, I have not heard that before and I can't <laughs> wait to find a spot to do it or I might do it myself. You might have to share that recipe, brother, so we uh -oh. can <laughs> share a version of that recipe so we can all make it. Yeah. How hot is the grease? That's, all my, that's my question. Oh, it's hot as a mug. It's hot because it fries, it fries the batter. It's my grandma's yellow cake batter. So it fries it down to the watermelon. So the watermelon's boiling hot, but like it's cake all around it. And then we add a little bit of my grandma's homemade vanilla icing, which is part of the whole Kwekwek experience. Kwekwek um, in the Philippines is where they, they take a, a quail egg, they boil a quail egg, they put it in a batter and deep fry it. It's like savory though. So the, my wife just took that concept because most of the food in Southeast Asia is circular, battered, and fried. It's like uh, it's the equivalent to like sandwich. When you say sandwich in the Western world, it could be peanut butter sandwich or like a Reuben, but it's still the same concept. 
So my wife took that concept to adapt to the market and it just took on its life of its own. Awesome. Well, you know, I got to come to Manila so I can get me some because you've been branding this hard on Instagram. So <laughs> next, I'm going to take it. We got to get it popping, y'all. We got Tanisha Sims Summers with Naughty But Nice Kettle Corn from Birmingham, Alabama. How you doing, love? Popping. What's popping? Nice to meet you. Yes, Fred, I got to get on that. I'm a watermelon girl anyway, but fried, I've never even imagined watermelon being fried. So I got to take a trip, but yeah. So, um, so yeah, we are we're dealing with a little oil and popping and all that stuff too. I'm Tanisha Sim Summers. I'm the founder and CEO of Naughty But Nice Kettle Corn Company. Um, we've been in business for six years here in Birmingham, Alabama. Um, our three streams of our business model is shipping, so we can ship nationwide. Um, we also have um, a production space that we have limited hours for customers to pick up. And then just this year, we are so excited to have added Miss Poppy, our kettle corn food truck on Juneteenth. What better day to have started a food truck than on Juneteenth um, in this climate of COVID. And so um, we specialize in sweet and salty kettle popcorn, hence our name. And um, essentially all of our flavors are gonna have a lightly sweet, lightly salted base. We start with the classic original kettle corn. From there we build, we create a French toast. So we use an actual cinnamon spice in the cooking process. Um, our Birmingham mix or our Beeham mix, that's a mixture of our cinnamon and our cheddar. So that's gonna be savory and spicy. So it's like breakfast in a bag, guys, like literally. And then my favorite is the jalapeno popper. So we infuse jalapenos. Did your mom like it, Ariel? <laughs> yes, she did. So my mom's birthday was this past weekend. I was in Birmingham and she had the jalapeno popper and she had the uh, green apple. I had the green apple too, so she loved it. She loves spicy things. She actually accidentally dropped a little bit of it, cried a little bit, and scooped the rest of it and saved it. So, <laughs> you got it. You got it. Well, that's good. That means it's good. That's me. We're working with something, but I, I never had um, any passion or love for popcorn. Um, I, I would say I'm just an entrepreneur by passion. And um, when I um, got married and I, I had a, a son already and my husband and I, and we had two other daughters. And when I got pregnant with the, um, with my uh, six-year-old, um, it was like, I, I was ready to transition from corporate America and really kind of like step out on faith. So Miss Poppy is popping around. We do a lot of events, festivals, catering events. And so um, it's really an interesting twist on what people know as just regular popcorn. So our tagline on our truck is it's not just popcorn. So we've been popping for the last six years and so happy to be amongst you foodies. Welcome, welcome. And last but certainly not least, this is someone that is not a stranger to the Food Truck Scholar podcast, Crystal McCants with Trey Pays Rolling Cafe. How are you? Make sure you unmute yourself. <laughs> Go ahead. Hold on, we'll give me one second. Okay, so we're having a little bit of technical issues with Krista. Um, internet is lagging, but hey, it's all good. Um, I think there's a delay, but until she's able to come back in. So for those who have listened to the Food Truck Scholar podcast, you know that I've had Krista on season one of the Food Truck Scholar. She's one years old in the game, which is absolutely amazing. Um, and it's named for her sons, Trey and Pay. So I have loved Crystal for the sole fact is that she can cook just about any and everything. <laughs> so everything I've loved, everything we've had, it's been absolutely amazing. We're gonna give us some time to come out and then hop right back in. Um, but while that's happening, I do wanna make sure that if you have questions, whether you're on Facebook or if you're on the Zoom webinar, make sure that you drop them in the chat. Josh and Anthony are going to be taking a look at those and making sure that we answer as many of them as possible. Uh, we may not get to everybody's questions within the hour that we have, but 
have no fear. I have created a Facebook group for Black food entrepreneurs so we can continue this conversation that we've been having through this webinar series. So I encourage you all to join it. I will be sending out a link with information for everybody who signed up so you can join that webinar and together, or join that group rather, and together we can all share the information that we have. Um, Crystal, are you able to come in? Let me see. Hey, y'all. My name is I'm the owner of Trey Page Rolling Cat. Um, I'm one year in the game. It's been a long time giving up. Food is my passion. My children are my pride and joy. That's why I named the truck after them. I needed something to motivate me to get up every day or the days that I do work. Um, so I'm loving it. I cook everything from so on time and they roll like an egg roll. And they come with a sweet Thai chili sauce, one of our crowd favorites. Um, so regular concession food, hot dogs, nachos, but our community, they love the soul food. And that's my pride and joy. My grandma used to cook. I didn't know that my mom could cook until I got in the living and this really she's really the backbone of it. She um she can she can throw down pretty well. So being one one year I'm learning a lot. I'm loving it. I actually moving into a brick and mortar across the street from where we park our truck in Mobile, Alabama. So I'm ready to be like y'all three, four, five, six years in the game and being able to really leave a legacy for my kids. I can tell you're breaking up a little bit, Krista, so you can try going to another room and see if it's a little bit better. Um, but hey, it's what we do. Internet, we all know how Al Gore's internet is in the midst of Rona, so that's all good and well. Um, so as she's doing that, I will have a question for the other two panelists. So I'm gonna start with Tanisha Sims. We're gonna start popping with you. So, you know, <laughs> you're gonna go ahead and unmute yourself so we can go back and forth. Uh, one of the questions that we often get a lot is food truck or trailer. So do we do that? Do we get it new? Do we get it used? Do we build it? So what, what was your experience with that? Um, and why did you make the decision that you made? Yeah. So um, I think that that's a really great question and um, very ideal for our situation. We actually experienced um, a transition um, and, and had to dibble and dabble in both. So when we started out, um, we you know, used a commissary, but we were extremely mobile to the, res to the respect that our equipment rolled out of an actual trailer. That's how we started. So um, my husband and I, you know, we were, our family was growing. So then we invested in a Suburban because we knew, okay, that could carry our family, but also it could pull this trailer that we had to transport our equipment. And so um, we spent the first few, you know, I would say the first year and a half or so, um, just, you know, we would pack up this equipment, take it to these different events, and it just really became cumbersome and exhausting. And so when we figured out how to be able to, th that the market could bear for us to produce our product and, and take it versus always having to transport the trailer, we began to do that. So um, probably about two years ago, before we um, actually made the move to purchase the truck, um, we were in a lot of limbo. We were like, okay, is the next step for us like a popcorn shop? You know, we're already mobile. So is that kind of being redundant to get a food truck when you already have a trailer? Like, does that really make sense? Um, for us, we didn't cook on the trailer. 
we had to roll it off. So some people are able to operate on a trailer. Um, I personally liked the idea of being able to transition to starting to think about growing a team. You know, every time I make a decision, I don't make it just based on where I am currently in life. I base it on what I know the passion and vision is, which is to make people's lives sweeter, um, one kernel at a time. And that is also through growing a team strategically so that we can pour into them. And so when you start thinking about pulling a trailer, now that they have to have a truck, you don't have to park the trailer. Parking a trailer is very tedious and is not the same as parking an actual food truck. So for us, we landed on food truck. Um, we purchased it last year's when our journey began and um, we just completed it this year. But I will say, um, for branding purposes, for logistics purposes, having an actual truck to kind of bring it all together, to me, it's just been a much more rewarding experience. And as far as getting it newer used, I mean, we had a very unique concept. So for us, we really needed a very raw blank canvas for our truck. Now, if you're, you know, cooking or frying, you know, someone's selling a truck, um, I would definitely say look at maybe getting something already built because they would have gone through the specs and the specifications, um, you know, going through getting um, permitted and things like that. But with the laws and food truck constantly changing, you do need to be aware of when you make such a big investment and if it already has equipment on it, making sure that equipment is up to code especially fire code, because you do have to make sure your hood vented service, you got to make sure that, um, you know, now they're making you have um, uh, detectors for your propane, so you're not blowing up communities, you got to make sure, you know, you're properly licensed and insurance. And so if you're going to put that type of investment into an older truck, I would just uh, encourage you to think about how old is the equipment, and, you know, making sure you're not paying a whole bunch of money for used stuff when maybe you could um, just get newer equipment that has warranties and things like that. So I do think you need to look at your budget, um, look at the requirements for the city that you're in. And, um, you know, when you get that truck inspected and you're looking at, you know, under the hood of the truck and even the equipment, you know, take those things into consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. How about you, man? Okay, so the question was, what do we do as far as a comparison of, repeat the question for me, because I, I was I'm so focused on what Tanisha was saying that. Yeah, because she dropped a lot of gems. So yeah. did you do a truck or did you do a trailer? And it, was it new or was it used? So out here in Manila, there is a huge um, pop-up scene. So it's part of the culture of Southeast Asia, whether you're talking about <clears throat> Thailand, Cambodia, or the Philippines, there's a huge night market scene, okay? And you see that being exported to the U.S. with like 626 night market, um, Charm City night market in Baltimore. So, and then that kind of translates into Smorgasburg in New York, uh, and now in D.C. and L.A. There's, there's this sort of um, open air market feel that's synonymous with Southeast Asian culture. So when I first came out here, the idea of a food truck doesn't really exist out here in Manila. They have them, but they're very much a niche and new thing. Um, but the concept of an open air night market or, or farmer's market predates, you know, it's like it's, it's thousands of years old out here. So when I came out here, I was, I, came, I was lucky enough to come into an established culture of like pop-up markets. So they'll like, the, the markets out here, uh, an, organized, an organization will actually create like sort of the hard like um, tents that are like stainless steel, like really durable with like awning. So you can, with monsoon season, people are still coming to the farmer's market or the night market because there's so much coverage that you can eat while it's doing a typhoon. So I've definitely served food in the typhoon because they're just so used to it, okay? So when we came out here, the idea was, were we gonna do like a brick and mortar? That was really our question, pop-up market or brick and mortar? And we found something that was sort of in between. We were, we were lucky enough to get into a good market that actually allowed us to get invitations to schools. Out here, and um, at least in the Philippines, they, it's a lot of Catholic schools. Um, and the thing they do is they like to have events within the school. So like you imagine like a homecoming event, 
the way these organizations actually make money, like the, the band or whatever the, the org may be, the way they make money is they have like a week where the, the, the government, the student government allows them to have like sort of the free reign on the campus and they sell vendor spots. So then they go out and they scout vendors and we happen to be in a really popular market uh, for our Sunday farmer's market. So we got a lot of invitations from schools, uh, colleges, uh, uh, graduate schools, and they would say, hey, we're having our org event to raise money. And they don't do like the Krispy Kreme on the side of the road thing that you see in the States. The kids like to stay inside the school. So you get that sort of airplane, I'm not airplane, airport model where you get a captive audience. So you get these, and they're all like private schools that are pretty like well like walled so the kids can't leave like it's like an airport you're stuck in your gate so for that week or two weeks depending on the the run of the market we are in that school um and that has been so good to us that we didn't go the brick and mortar because we found that during the brick and mortar we had a kiosk um prior to what we're doing now we in a we had like a little ice cream company and the problem with that is the mall we were in died you know it's just a mall opened up across the street and our landlord wasn't like, it's like that Jay-Z skit. It's like, pay me. Like they weren't trying to hear nothing. So we got to that point where we were like, man, we're never going to be someplace where we can't pack up and leave. Now, um, like Tanisha said, it, it, it did become cumbersome having to pack that stuff up. You know, um, we actually have a guy that does our driving for us. Um, but still, we have to bring it from our storage into the, the, um, the car and unload it and pack it up. But we, we were lucky enough to get really good staff. That's when we decided, hey, we're doing this so often we need staff. So it wasn't just my wife and I. We actually hired staff and we got a book to be able to sort of organize all our events. So before Rona, we were doing school events. And a school event could be anywhere from three days to 12 days. We were doing like three or four of those per week. So I say on a, a good month, I only work 15 days, but it's, it's like shoveling in the dough because the kids can't go anywhere or the customers can't go anywhere. They're, they're eating breakfast, lunch, and dinner at your booth. Awesome, awesome. So we're gonna transition on to the second question. We got one that come in that said, uh, let me see. What's the best way to find out what your local requirements are for equipment and sanitation on a mobile food unit? And I'll take a little bit of that. And then Krista, Fred, Tanisha, anything I say that's wrong or you want to add to it, by all means, jump in because we want to transition to the next one, is usually your health department gives you an idea of you have an application that you need to complete. And they will usually tell you these are the things that we're looking for. Um, some, of, some cities have gotten very good at it and they know the food truck business and they say, hey, they'll break it down and say, OK, are you going to serve hot things? on your food truck? Are you preparing it on the truck or is it gonna be prepared elsewhere? And because of those different um, distinctions, they will evaluate your truck based upon that. Um, I'll say another uh, great avenue is that there's a mobile food uh, virtual conference that I've gone to quite a few times in person in Columbus, Ohio. They're having a virtual one that's happening in the next few weeks. As soon as I get information on that, I will happily share that with you. And usually they have the Columbus uh, Health Department actually comes out and gives a presentation on what you need to have. For example, you can't have your propane um, less than 38, uh, I think it was like 38 inches from, like, from the ground or something like that. And to make sure that you're uh, filling your propane or you measuring it rather once it's full. Because if you add the propane after, it actually drops it down a little bit and then you could have a surprise event or a surprise inspection from the health department and you fail because of that. So usually your health department is the first place you want to go to get those questions. Uh, Krista, Fred, Tanisha, you wanted to add anything on that one? Yeah, the health department, um, starting with the... Uh, yeah, you pretty much go to the health department for everything you need. Because like me, I started with a food truck. I wanted a brick and mortar. That's where I wanted to go on my head, but I couldn't afford it. So I started with the food truck. That was an old truck. It had nothing in it. Um, I had to put everything in it. I'm very frugal. So I bought pretty much everything used. Um, I did waste a lot of money. So it is good to plan out. And that's the reason you need to go to the health department first, because when you go, they tell you you need to have a plan on how you're going to have your truck set up, what equipment you're going to have in it, where is it going to go, 
by exact measurements. I wasted a lot of money, um, for instance, my steam table, because I do soul food. So to have my collard greens, macaroni, lima beans, turkey necks, smothered turkey necks. I bought the steam table in my head thinking, okay, I could just have it on the warmers, be able to hook the propane up to it and then keep my food warm. It didn't work out that way. I got a steam table converted from gas to propane, not knowing the gas, the, the fire was gonna be coming from underneath the table in the truck. So that, that didn't work. And I also wasted money hooking up a propane line to the table that's fifteen hundred dollars gone down the drain. But if I would have did what the health department told me to do, I was trying to do it my way. I was trying to do it the easy, quick way because I was ready to go to work. I bypassed some things, and it kind of it, it made me waste money and space in my truck. So um, yeah, the health department is the right way to go. You you think that they're telling you wrong or they're being hard on you, but they are for reasons for yourself and for safety of your customers. So the health department, um, the fire department, because you have to go through them to make sure your hood vent system, your suppression system, which I don't have to, because I was trying to save money. So technically my truck is a concession truck. I'm not supposed to cook in my truck. Um, I do majority of my cooking at my commissary kitchen. So I tell anybody, like Tanisha said, if you can find a truck that pretty much has everything in it, the way that you want it, your fryer, your flat top, to go that route, because I tried to save money, but really I didn't. And I don't have a functional kitchen. So now I'm working my way to get in the brick and mortar, which we have the address, the temporary pole put up. And I'm, I'm going to follow their directions this time and do what they tell me to do so that this process is easier and is going to be done right. So um, like Tanisha said, it's a hassle with moving and packing and unloading when, I, when doing events. If I would have just followed the instructions in the beginning, it probably would have been a whole lot easier. But I'm making it work. So yeah, I, I say talk to people who already have a food truck. Um, go to your health department, make sure you're following their guidelines correctly. And just, just try to get somebody to mentor you that's already you know, done that so that you're doing things the right way because it is tough. It's tough. I feel it. I feel it. And so we have two questions that's coming in that are about menus and I'm smiling because if I've had Everybody is self Fred. I haven't been to the Philippines yet, but I'm smiling. I can see some of the answers. So Vincent wants to know, how do you know when your menu is too complicated to prep for service? What is a good mix or strategy to keep it efficient for the kitchen or in your kitchen space on your truck? So, I mean, I don't mind chiming. Oh, okay, Fred, you want to take that? Oh, no, you got it. You got it. Well, I I'm, I'm, I'm probably won't go into as much depth as you because I have kettle corn and I don't have all these amazing different sides and all that. But I mean, you know, uh, to, to mimic what Krista said, you know, obviously, you know, that goes back to menu prepping, right? You want to talk to your peers in the industry, people who have been doing this. Um, I think they probably will have um, more in-depth information um, if, you know, than even sometimes the health department because now they right. can tell you what they did wrong and right. Sometimes the health department, and again, the health department obviously is your first thing. I, I'm just like Krista, it's like, I wanted to go fast, I wanted to get there, but then I had to kind of pump my brakes. So where it took us a whole year to actually get the truck up from the time of purchase, I spent that time talking to peers, I spent that time going back and forth with the health department before I spent a dime because sometimes they're confused because if you have a new concept or if it's a unique type of food item, um, the laws are constantly changing. You need to decide, am I only going to be locally in my area or do I plan on going out of the state? So now you have different um, requirements and parameters for different areas. So I encourage people to think about the most strictest city that has the strictest requirement. And if you can meet those, then you can not box yourself into just your local municipality. But then going further to the menu, um, although we're kettle corn, we have to start being very strict. Like, yes, we have 10 flavors. We don't want to get too more, more complicated than that. 
Um, whenever we do fun, unique flavors, it's going to be like a seasonal flavor a monthly. But whether you're doing a snack food like us or a more, um, you know, a more complicated menu, I would say keep it simple. K-I-S, keep it simple, stupid, right? They used to tell me that in corporate America. Um, you know, if, a lot of times I think us food people, we... Um, we struggle with wanting to be creative and we want everybody to know everything that we have all the time. I don't think that's necessary. I think you need to understand what is the main flow of your business and you keep it, people want consistency. So even if it's kind of the same five items, keep those same five items. Now, when you want to get creative, maybe you offer a more creative menu when it comes to catering. So that's when you can kind of pull in some of your other unique dishes but for cost effective purposes, for planning and prepping um, and to maintain the quality of, of, your, of your menu, uh, I think that a simplified menu is what you should keep on your truck um, just to keep it consistent and then pull in those other unique dishes that you offer um, during special events or you know, mainly for catering. And you can then give them a more unique menu that's not often found on your everyday menu. That that is how I would probably address it. And I would I would I would follow. I'm glad I let you go first because you said a lot of the things and queuing up what I'm going to say. Mm -hmm. I I subscribe to the keep it simple, stupid. Like that's that is the words to live by. Because when we first started Maryland Chicken. Um, we were doing everything, like everything that my grandma could cook that my, my wife liked, we started like adding that. But um, when I really became more heavily involved in the business, I was like, no, like we have to, we have to strip it all down. So we do popcorn chicken, we do four uh, types. And the difference between the dishes is just sauce. It's still the same like chicken base, um, the same like marinating and, and, and um, same batter and the same amount of rice. So I, I, one of the things that I wanted to do is sort of keep it really standard. So you get that sort of McDonald's um, consistency. Because the one thing you hear about foreigners when they go to other countries, they go to McDonald's and they're like, it's the same, you know? <clears throat> now, as far as what you wanna do, as far as keeping, like figuring out what what you personally wanna create and, and how, how sophisticated you want your menu to be, think about how much money you wanna make. You wanna, you wanna keep that as your, your target goal and then work backwards into safety. So if you say, okay, I, I wanna make this amount of money, you look at your price and then you say, all right, to make that amount of money, I have to serve this many items, okay? This quantity of item. Then you say, all right, how physically, how, 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 what can I, what's my capacity? And you don't really know that until you're pressured. Then you wanna ask yourself the final question, the most important question, money's the least important, health and safety is the, the most important because we're not selling like, you know, figurines, we're selling something that can make people sick. So you wanna figure out, can I meet my price? Can I meet my capacity? And then can I meet my safety? And once you figure that out, you can say, all right, I can serve a thousand units and hit my target goal, okay? Or maybe go over it. I can, I can hit uh, 500 units and hit my goal. I can, you know, and you work back like that. So we, the, one of the reasons why we did um, deep fried watermelon uh, in the US, other than the fact that I didn't wanna bring chicken from Maryland back to Maryland, because we do events in the US. Um, <clears throat> I didn't want to have overly complicated food items because my, I have less staff in the US. So I, I wanted to sort of say, all right, this is my capacity as far as staffing. And I, I just picked one thing. So I remember we joined um, an event in New York called Vegandale. So they were like, oh, you need to have more than two items. And I was like, we've got uh, deep fried watermelon. And they're like, what else? And I was like, water? And they're like, okay, that's two. Because <laughs> all we sell is deep fried watermelon. And you know, and it's because I only had two staff members. Here in the Philippines, I have like 12 staff members. So I can do the different chickens. I can have like two different um, cooking and serving and prepping stations. So when we do our little pop-up tent, we have the capacity to do close to a thousand orders. Okay. But when we are in the US, we can do, I think we've we've maxed out like around like around 800. So almost the same but with less than half, a, a fraction of the staff, because I said, we're gonna just do this one item and that's gonna increase our productivity. And with that food item, we can get to the point of safety. Uh, as far as a food truck and like sort of the parameters, we do events in the US uh, throughout, throughout fall. So like the end of August into November, we're in the US. And the reason why on the East Coast with you know winter and everything, 
the time to do events is the best in the fall. Okay, everybody's having their fall fling and their and their you know their harvest festival is just part of our culture. Um, in the Philippines, there's fewer events in the fall because that's monsoon season. So people are less likely to have as many events, and a lot of times they get rained out. The few they do have, so we've modified, you know, going to the U.S. for half the year. But with that being said, it's not like I can just stay in D.C. because it's not enough events for me to fly all into the country, you know, and, and just do the few there. So I go then D.C. I do Baltimore. I do New York and um, we do Annapolis. So we have to go to different areas and it's so different. Like what's going on in New York as far as, you know, what we can do is different than our configuration for Baltimore. Like, um, like you can't switch propane tanks, you know, like one state will allow you to switch propane tanks, other one doesn't let you. So we gotta get a bigger propane tank or we have to, you know, make sure that we can't use our leftover propane tank. Cause like if I do an event in a certain state that allows me to switch propane tanks then I'm all good. But, but if I go to New York, I have to get a big one and keep it full. And even if I've only you know, used a half of it and I got 25% left, I can take that to another state and finish it off. But if I go to New York, I gotta get a fresh one full. So the way our, um, our configuration is, even though we don't have a truck, we are able, I have like a New York configuration, a Baltimore configuration, an Annapolis configuration based off of their different um, uh, uh, situations. And um, for instance, I remember we did an event in Bowie, Maryland. And the health department, no, the, the fire department was like, oh, you got to take your tent down. It's not fire rated. I was like, well, it's rated for California. They're like, this ain't California, this is Bowie. So I was like, okay. So I had to go get a different tent. But New York, on the other hand, doesn't mind the, the tent that's rated for California. So I was still able to use that tent. So even though I could have said to myself, hey, I want to just buy one tent that's good everywhere. In the end, I just, you have to go through the motions. And then you just sort of learn, okay, this is what I do. This is what I don't do. It's really hard to figure out, especially if you're, you're going to different states, it's really hard to avoid the mistake stage of, of, of getting right. So Krista, I'm coming to you. One, to answer the question about, um, wow, I just lost my whole train of thought right there. But, <laughs> but I'm also gonna answer this question, but also the question about long lines as well. So we know that you have a pretty good menu. I wish I could eat everything off your menu. So one, I wanna go back to the question you were talking about in terms of, do you have a small menu or a big menu or do you change certain things out? But I think this also works very well for you because you have turned Mobile upside down uh, with your food truck and you have had live, yes, you have, don't be modest, you sell out regularly. So how have you been able to uh, keep up with the menu, change things out, but also handle all the customers that you got? Okay. Typically, I'm going to be honest. I don't know what I'm going to sell sometimes. Next week, I don't know what I'm selling. I'm just being honest. I have a, in my head, I know what I want to do, but the time, kids, this, I'm like, okay, this week I want to give them, I always give them something smothered. We always have some smothered every week. But my menu, if I do smothered turkey necks, macaroni, rice and gravy, green beans, that's the meal for the day. I don't, I can't, like uh, Fred, that's the name, right? Safely, I, I try to stay very conscious about making sure my customer's food is safe. I love to give them fried chicken every day, hamburgers, this, that. But I typically, when I do one soul food meal, that's the meal of the day. Um, the dessert, I always have our New Orleans style snowballs, our Christmas Kool-Aid, because I grew up drinking Kool-Aid, and our Zanzibar sweet tea, which is our version of our Arnold Palmer. is named after my dad. His nickname was Zan, so I call it Zanzibar sweet tea. But I only do one meal for the day. And in my head, I love to serve the whole mobile, but I can't. So in my head, I might say, okay, from I'm open from 1130 to full, I'm gonna serve 250 people, that's it. And my goal is to sell out every day because I know I'm not gonna open back up the next day and sell the same thing. And I don't wanna take that food home. If if I was to have food left over, I just give it to whoever. But I always do one meal. <sighs> now, long lines, okay? <laughs> Keep the secret. When we do chicken wings, when we do chicken wings, I have to talk myself into it. And 
it takes me like a month to talk myself into doing chicken wings because once again, my truck is not made for that. It's, it's not made for it. And when I post that I'm doing chicken wings, 30 calls show up at one time, 40 calls show up at one time. And the last time I did chicken wings, my deep fry went out on me and I cried as I handed all my customers back their money. Yes, one of them, Erica Carrier, she cried with me because I was heartbroken. I took, it took myself a month to do talk myself into doing chicken and my deep fry would not even work. Mm. Had bought a new deep fry, it wouldn't work. I had to turn all my customers around, but not just with chicken alone lines. When I do my chicken, rolled chicken, spinach and cheese wontons, they love them. Um, they come out for them. And some of them have waited an hour. <laughs> some of them have waited an hour. Some of them have waited an hour and a half. And I appreciate my customers because they do understand that I'm not a fast food truck. I'm a food food truck. And I make I cook their food to order and I make sure it's, it's as fresh as possible and that they enjoy it when they get it. So the problem I have is not the long lines is that everybody tend to show up at one time. So if you got 20 calls ahead of you and it's taking me five to 10 minutes per call, you're going to wait a little bit. But I'm trying to educate my mobile community on food truck etiquette that some food trucks, people will wait to get their food. They wait another for my customers and the patients that they have with me when they do have to wait. Um, little do they know, they're teaching me how to be a successful business owner. When I do get that brick and mortar at 7113 9th Street in Mobile, Alabama, I can't wait to open it up for them. Um, but I've learned a lot along the way. And like I said, I can't, I can't thank and appreciate my customers. I, I appreciate them so much. They taught me a lot and I'm learning along the way. So yeah, I'm, I'm trying to keep those long lines down and I'm trying to give them a variety of food that's fresh and safe every time I give it to them. But just bear with me. As soon as I get the building, I'll be like, Fred, I'll be able to have those 12 people working. Right now, it's just me, my mom, Karen, and my brother, Cameron. And I appreciate them most because if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be able to do it. It's and you know, it's always, mm -hmm. it's always a good question to ask because some people are like, oh, I can't have a, bad, a, a long line. It's not about not having a long line. If you don't have a long line, I mean, come on, we celebrate it. No. I stood in her line. For, come on, Slutty Vegan is a prime example of that. I have stood in her line for an ungodly hey, word. amount yeah. of hours. <laughs> <laughs> I been there. If other people want it though. Like if nobody's there, that's almost an indication of like why, why, why do I even want to eat there? But Krista made a very very strong point like your teach your 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 um your your customers they teach you along the way and i think the best way like we get so afraid of messing up we get so afraid of people waiting i think what we have to become more confident in is teaching our customers how to teach to to buy from us um having a level of transparency telling your story and i think the more you talk about your mom helping you and your children people have a sense of empathy and compassion for you and they actually enjoy growing on that journey along the way with you so long lines are really like that's a success and it's, it's just showing them that this is how we do this you know so I, I love I love that point that you made Krista thank you now I have an ex I have two different answers given the two different markets that I serve so in the U.S. I have a line and I find that having a line really helps build sort of that, that sort of FOMO. People, even if your food's great, if they don't see a line, people are not lining up. And that's very Americanized. Now on the other side, uh, in, the, in the Philippines, I have, we can turn over products so fast that I play a sort of game and I say, there's no line. So what I do is I have a crowd of people and it's a game, my wife hates it. But like my staff, like we're, we're click tight, like it's a complete game because most of my things are, are are students. So they have to get in and get out in between the bell. So what I'll do is we'll get ready in between the bells and then I'll take orders. So I'll take 10 orders and get 10 orders out, 10 orders, 10 orders out. So it's like a stock market thing. And we have like little slips and I tell people there's no, there's no order. 
like you're, nobody's first. I don't care if I took your order before him. If I say Bowie Buffalo chicken, the first Bowie Buffalo that raises their hand is going to get it. So I, what I do is I maintain a conversation as well. So we'll be talking about Marvel films. We'll be talking about you know Breaking Bad. We'll be talking about like pop culture stuff as I'm getting everybody's order. Take the money and I turn around. And say, all right, let's get some orders out. And then we the, we stop the group conversation. We get the orders out. Then we go back. Da da da. All right, da da da. So as, as long as you have a ticket, you trade the ticket for your food. There is, and I tell them, look, I can put you guys in line and I can get you guys your food. The problem is, y'all walk slow, and if you don't walk slow, you'll be behind. Be behind someone that walks slow. So I don't even want to do that because then it's not about how fast I'm serving the food. It's about how fast you walk. I was like, firstly, I was like, secondly, this way we can all talk because I don't want to serve you food. I want to serve you food with conversation. I want to give you that sort of American barbershop feel, which is a, a cultural element that I bring to my, uh, my, my, my store that's new to this culture. So it's a huge selling point. I'm asking everybody, how's your day? They don't want to tell me. They can just be like, eh, you know, or they can tell me how their day is. But like, I'm going to ask every customer, how's your day? And we're going to get into a debate I remember I um, had like a, a, a crowd of about maybe like 40, 50 people. We were having this lively debate about like aliens. Uh, we were talking about the, the Doctor Strange movie. And he was saying, oh, the character in that movie is an alien. I'm like, oh no, he was an interdimensional creature. And he's like, oh, if you're from a different dimension, you're an alien. And I was like, no, aliens are only creatures from our dimension, not on our planet. So I'm having this really in-depth conversation that has nothing to do with food, but they're kids, they love it, I love it. So we're having this conversation, but in between the conversation, I'm getting them out faster than they would in a line. Because if they were, because and, and the thing is I time against my neighbor who has a line. So I'm like, man, you got a conversation. I asked you how your day was and you got your food, you know, it, and it's in the fact, it's like the stock market where everyone's like da -da -da, with their tickets. And it's, it's, it's sort of an experiment, but the, on, the only part is we really get screwed if something goes wrong, like a power outage, or, 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 or when you said your stove went out, I've had nightmares about that one time I got <laughs> too cocky and I had like, you know, like, like, like 80 orders, like 80 orders out and my stove broke and my new girl that was on the stove didn't tell me because she was a little like intimidated. So I got the girl cooking chicken, not telling me that the fryer, not telling me the stove broke, you know, 15 minutes ago, the people doing the saucing don't know. So they're just like, yo, where's the chicken? And then the new girl on the stove is kind of like, but then like it trickles down to me, sir. Oh man, they got, they went from, let's talk about, you know, the last episode of South Park to I'ma kill you real fast. Wow. <laughs> you got, you, wow. So you gotta have a team and that goes with configuration, making sure like if a stove breaks, you have a backup stove. So like I said, it goes back to the, what I was saying. It really depends on you making mistakes and modifying for the future. Every mistake I make leads me to always have an extra stove. If we're doing an event that has electricity, you know, I'll always keep a uh, gas set up just in the in the back, just in case electricity goes out. So it blows a fuse being stupid. It doesn't mess with me. So it's just one of those like things that you learn over time. But mm -hmm. getting the people out with a little bit of a smile in the conversation, it always works. Uh, we have 10 minutes left. So the time has flown by. So I got I do. We, we have a couple of things I do want to get out. So I have some questions that's in the chat. Um, and one I think is, is very simple. Like, do you need to notify the city each time you post up in a different town? So I do know that you have to have permits and when you're in different spaces, especially different counties. But when you're going to a city, for example, whether it's Mobile to Birmingham or Birmingham to Trustville or whatever the case may be, do you have to notify the city or do you have to apply for a permit? So, um, and I can take this one, Ariel. Yeah, you definitely have to um, notify because I mean, that's not only is it um, a health department issue, it's also um, with the municipalities and paying your taxes. And so you never want to get to a situation where you've invested in traveling from one city to the next and you haven't prepared and, and, um, and well, you've prepared or overly prepared and then now they're kicking you out or you have this unexpected fee so I would always, you know, just do your due diligence. I mean, generally, if you're going to another city, hopefully you're partnering somebody. Krista, I would love to partner with you and Frederick, but I think if you partner with people in different cities, that's a definite, um, a definitely a good way to start expanding your brand because now you have an end to that city. They can give you 
kind of, you know, um, kind of help you navigate through what those requirements are, or you're either connected to an event organizer, I would never recommend just going to a random city popping up without making a connection with an organizer, another truck, and of course, having your licensing and um, your permitting in place. Thank you. And it all comes down to research, y'all. So you, everybody's different. Like as Frederick just said, and he gave a great example, New York, some things fly in New York, some things don't fly in New York. And some things that he can do in New York, he can transfer to another city, but he can't come into New York with different types of propane. So I think he gave you a great example, and Tanisha, you followed up as well, is that every city is different. And so do not go into that city blind and unprepared. The food truck industry, as with any industry, is all about research. So research, research, research. We have another question that's coming in. Uh, it's a follow-up question when it comes down to pre-cooking. Uh, so what needs to be cooked to order versus what can be cooked, you know, about 90% and then reheated and finish the order? Um, I'll jump in. For our, for our food, and we, we have to deal with this with like the, the health department, we have a, um, a commissary in, the, in DC, but the, the issue was our food is all cooked on the spot. You can't store deep fried watermelon. It's like fried ice cream. So we had an interesting situation where we needed to have a kitchen, but we didn't really need the kitchen, but we needed it for just sort of like the licensure. And um, uh, trailing on the other conversation, one of the reasons why I love events is because we do events all across Metro Manila. Metro Manila, uh, Philippines is about three times the size of New York. So certain cities that are in like the municipality have different like guidelines, but event organizers organize typically in that city. So they will already give you what you have to do. So we've been, we've been lucky to really not have to do any research because signing up to an event means they walk you through everything you need. So that really helps us. So we have a roadmap of like, areas like Quezon City, um, you know, versus Makati versus Alabang. Um, these are all cities within like what's called Metro Manila. And we just know what's good in those areas because the organizers tell us you have to have this. Same thing for like New York. I learned about New York because Vegandale gave me all the information so I could show up. Um, yeah, but when you have fresh food that's cooked on the spot, it I, I find that's the best. But for our chicken, we cook um, in our kitchen here, and then we bring it frozen. So we marinate it, we freeze it, and then we bring it to the event, dethaw it. So it just depends on what you're serving. Yeah, I would jump in very quickly to say, you know, it also, to your point, depends on what you're serving and also the prep time that it takes for that. If that's something that you know takes a long amount of time that you may have to slow roast or preheat or marinate, try to do that ahead of time. You don't want to try to marinate something on a truck. Don't do that. Um, the next question, I'm seeing a lot of questions about funding. Um, so some people want to know what has been the most effective forms of funding for you to get your business off the ground? Um, uh, did you have someone help you? Did you do Kickstarter? Did you do a business loan? Did family stuff and say, God bless you, baby? Like, what exactly? <laughs> How did you fund your business? I see everybody's face like, oh. <laughs> what was the funding like? Krista jumped. Oh, okay, go ahead, Krista. Oh, I um pretty much I, I tried doing selling t-shirts, $20, but I'm like, it 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 didn't do. I but that's why I started with the truck because that's what I could afford. And after I wasted some money with the truck, I was like, I probably could have got a building by this time, but um I just, I did it, did it on my own with the little, little money I had. Um, I'm sure if I would have did a GoFundMe, if I would have asked family for money, they probably would have given it to me. But I, I you know, I just did it myself. <laughs> I ain't had no choice. I had to yeah. get it rolling. I knew I wasn't going back to work for nobody else and had two kids to take care of. So I did what I had to do. And I, like I said, I thank God for my parents because I'm still living with them and they're able, they're helping me so that I can get my dream off the ground and afloat and that I am running it comfortably so that I can leave and not come back home again. So I, they helped me pretty much. <laughs> so, 
but oh, right. there are a lot of grants. If, it, if you get if you get a legit, I'm seeing that there are lots of grants, especially for Black minority women. My mom has been doing a lot of research on them, and they're out there. We just gotta fill out the paperwork to do it. I can't answer that one enough. Tanisha, what about you? Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll mimic Krista. I mean, I think uh, there. So first, I would encourage people to just remember that this is um, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. And right. um, there is no rush. First, remember that. Right. Um, secondly, so for us, I, I would just say I, I probably had some advantages. I started in um, the banking industry right after college. So I have some investment background I, I started seeing wealthy white uh businesses coming in and i was able to kind of pull and understand that hey you know you need to start an llc even before your business starts start building business credit i was fortunate enough to you know get um a, a seven years after even starting the llc i was able to obtain a, a um a twelve thousand dollar business credit card that i didn't have to guarantee um, then my bank was able to get me a line of credit. Uh, then we did have to get a separate loan for um, the food truck, a $50,000 loan. I would encourage people to use platforms like True Fund. Um, I think they're here in Birmingham, Louisiana, and New York. Um, they specialize in women-owned businesses. Um, I, so try to find some of those local community resources that aren't like banks. They traditionally kind of help you through the business planning process. Um, they may not give you the money, but um, initially, but they will help make you bankable. Um, but until you get to that point, because I know, like I said, it's not always packaged so pretty the way I just explained it. Um, I would encourage people to remember, again, it's not um, a sprint, it's a marathon. Secondly, do your research, figure out, I'm sorry, hold on one sec. It's all good. We, we are full-time entrepreneurs and folks with lives. So that is all, that is all well and good. Thank you. So, um, so um, once you get to that point that you really understand what's required, do the research, call the health department, figure out your menu, figure out your suppliers. When you get that bottom line number, now you can start managing to that. So I always tell people, start where you are. You don't have to have the truck to start. If you can cook, start selling on Facebook. Start, you know, partner with someone who already is in the food business and see if you could, um, you know, do the tent pop-ups. Like, do whatever it takes to start generating that revenue. Don't just stop and don't just wait. Test your market, test your concepts. Because, you know, your family, and this is what I found, you know, it's like your family, you, you know when you have a real business, when people are willing to pay money, top dollar for your product and do it consistently. And so it's different from your family saying, oh, girl, you can cook or, oh, man, what is that? But when you have proven that this is something that the market will pay for, you don't need a food truck to do it. Just do the best that you can where you are. I, sometimes you got to go under the radar a little bit. I'm not telling people to do nothing that <laughs> you shouldn't be doing. But yeah. what I am saying <laughs> is start where you are, okay? I mean, if it's your church, if it's, and I know COVID is definitely putting a big um, a barrier on what people typically can maneuver through because, you know, events and stuff are limited. But I just think that um, don't stress about I don't have the money right now do whatever it takes at that point to start marketing your business. There's so much that you could do to start growing your business. Get your financials in order. Understand your profit and loss. Understand your balance sheet. Like this is not stuff that you have to wait to get the truck to do. So that when you get the truck, now you have a very sound knowledge of how to maneuver as Frederick has been saying. And now you just, you're gonna present a great product to the market that now you can, you know, sell on a different scale. But I think you can start selling your meals. You know, you can do a GoFundMe. You can um, raise money for a certain amount of equipment to get you at a certain area. But I think partnerships are going to be your best way to leverage when you don't have a lot of money um, or a family who can just write a big check. Um, and so um, hopefully that helps. Absolutely. Um, for, for me, I'm the exact opposite. I understand everything, everything Tisha's saying is correct, but I was the exact opposite. 
my credit is shot. Like, like people wouldn't sell me a lollipop on credit. <laughs> so basically I just trapped it up. I just, I went to the smallest event that had the, you know, the lowest standards. And I was like, let's, let's <laughs> right. do an event. <laughs> and then I took that money and I just saved it up. I just, and I had like a quota. I was like, all right, I need to save all this money up to get to the next event. And then I just, I got a, um, a little like event book and I just started writing out events. And I was like, if I can hit all these and just turn a profit and save you know, 20% or 30% of that profit and then like eat off the rest, then by this month, I should have enough to be able to buy this extra equipment and do that. And I got an accountant and everything after that. But like, I, I just, I, I went and then I think maybe I, the first event I was at didn't even, I didn't have to be a real business. So they just, I guess like say flying under the radar, it, it would have been their fault in the end. Cause you know, I was partnering with them, <laughs> you know, but then eventually. Well, yeah, I had, yeah, 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 I agree with that. Yeah. I agree with that. Yeah. 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 Then, 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 but I think like maybe month six or so, I had enough money to actually pay for all my licenses and stuff. And then from there I, I kept going and I had enough money to get an accountant to get all my stuff straight. And then like, I just, you know, I, I started, had enough money to buy in bulk to like really bring down my costs. So it was one of those things where I just, I didn't, I didn't say, oh, I don't have enough money or I don't have enough whatever. I just, I just said, look, man, I just got to start selling and, and just make it happen. So I, I really looked at it as um, sort of like a, like, like I was selling drugs. I was like, man, I got to get a kilo of chicken. I got to flip that, chi that kilo to this. And then, you know, and I, and it just, it worked for me. Like, I'd be listening to Jeezy and I'd be like, yeah, like, yeah. Well, I, got, I got that flower, like, you know what I mean? But like, I, but you know, I was conditioned to just to be able to make it work and I did. You don't really have to have much except a good product and a place to sell it. Yeah. So we are over time, but if it's okay with y'all and if it's okay for people in the chat, I do want to go just a little bit more to answer some of these questions. So one, I, I do want to underscore the fact you start with where you're at. That's the common consensus that everybody has said, start with where you're at. Now, now the, the expert in me, scholar in me has to say, you know, serve safe or uh, safe serve, uh, that's your certification to make sure that you're, you know, preparing things safe. Cause we ain't got time for people to be sick. Cause that, that's a whole different wave uh, that you don't want to bring on yourself. And y'all didn't get that from the food trust scholar. So make sure that you apply for that. I know during COVID they have been doing different specials where you can take certain classes for free actually, and, and not have to pay the 170 some odd dollars that it normally mm -hmm. is. So take advantage of that. Um, but everybody in is uh, doing it so well in the chat is you start where you're at. I've talked to a lot of food truck owners that have started through the church. Uh, one in particular in Nashville, he was actually making the hot wings out of the, the church um, kitchen. You know, you can do that in a lot of different ways. Schools are an absolute great way to really start getting clientele and people coming in, actually being positioned by churches. I, I've noticed that a lot of um, food trucks in California, you can find them everywhere, but you can most definitely find many of them outside of schools. Uh, you see churches that partner with food truck owners. So there's a lot of different partnerships that can occur that way. Um, I also want to take a moment to quickly plug in for those in case they might dip out, is that there is going to be a link sent out. If you want to continue this conversation amongst each other and with some of the people that's in, on the panel, they would like to be a part of it. We're going to have a Black Food Entrepreneurs Facebook group that I would love to see you all in so we can continue this dialogue because we can't answer everything in an hour, y'all. We tried, <laughs> we failed, but we got a lot of good things in. But there's one thing that I really do want to talk about and that's social media. Um, a lot of people are saying, how do we talk about, or how do y'all rather talk about your food truck on social media? And I've seen each of you all and each of you all do it in amazing ways. Like Krista, you had a following before your food truck even launched. And Tanisha's over here, we got some loyal pop heads and branding about the food truck. Every time I see Frederick, you're talking about this deep fried watermelon that I have to know more about it. So like, he's been holding that part down. So Krista, I'm gonna go with you first. And I wanna talk about like, just how have you been able to build your following, especially on social media? I 
think she's far away. Come back. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, go ahead. Say what you said again, I couldn't hear you. Yeah, so just about your social media. So you actually was starting out with a following. I actually found you before your food truck had even launched. So you had already curated a social media following. And so how were you able to build a following before your food truck even launched? I would just cook different things at home. Some stuff that I do sell on the truck, some stuff I don't sell on the truck, but I just started making different things, posting pictures, and I always hashtag and trade page rolling cafe, hashtag good until it's gone, because that's my slogan. Like I said, I can't feed the whole mobile. So when I'm sold out, I'm sold out. And you know that my food is always good until it's gone. So every time I just um, posted the food, put the name, and when they finally seen the truck or what I was bringing to mobile, they were like, oh, that's what trade page rolling cafe. I seen that already. So every time I could, I posted it, posted the food, posted the name, Trey Page Rolling Cafe. And when I brought it out, they were like, oh, okay, I see you that. Oh, okay, I heard about that. And when they tasted the food, preferably all of them liked it. If they didn't, I'm sorry. Um, but most of them, they, they loved it and they come back and they send other people my way. So I just kept on branding the best way I know how. And it was a cheap way social media you didn't have to pay anybody to do anything i didn't have any money to advertise so that was my way of advertising for trey face rolling cafe tanisha what about you love um so you're saying um the question was about branding yes and how did you market on social media yeah so um so we first just identify like who are our main target so for us of course we do um, you know, festivals and community events, but um, we also, our product is not perishable, so we can ship. So that's an area of opportunity to just try to drive more traffic to our website. Uh, we had to reconfigure our whole website to make it just more e-commerce friendly. Um, but then we, um, we do a lot with corporations and wedding planners. So we know that our three platforms are going to be LinkedIn. Um, we're going to be on Instagram and we're going to be on um, Facebook. And uh, to Chris's point, it's just, you know, you're, you're showing those engaging images. We like to show how our customers are interacting and having fun or, you know, if they say something just out of this world, we like to show what they're saying. Of course, um, nice photos. And I think that was our challenge in the beginning is, you know, you want to make sure you're not, you know, taking pictures of the Thanksgiving dinner that's on the styrofoam plate and all the foods just slopped together. So presentation is everything in the food industry. You have to make it look appetizing, pulling it in, lighting is everything. So the marketing is the big piece. It tells the whole story. And um, for us, it's uh, also, um, you know, making sure we're increasing our presence on Google. So we're always asking, begging for reviews because um, there are people who may not socialize in the spaces that we're in. And they sometimes, you know, you could be missing opportunities. So if you're on Google and somebody's searching for, um, you know, certain, cer certain foods or whatever, then at that point you can, um, make sure you're having um, reviews so your customers can share their experience and um, it'll help people to engage and feel more comfortable with um, doing business with you. Um, Ms. Denisha, you're right about, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. No, I was just saying, Ms. Tanisha, how she said um, about her taking pictures, getting better at taking, I used to take pictures in the beginning before I started with the truck, but now that I get so busy and my time is just all over the place, I used to take them and I don't take them as much now. And I think I'm thankful for my customers that take pictures of their food, but I do a lot of some other stuff and it don't look too well after they take the pictures and I'd be like, oh, I don't like how that look. But I mean, it tastes well, but, um, Ms. Tanisha, how do you, when you get your customers to take pictures of your stuff, even though it's just popcorn, I guess I should be asking you, Mr. Fred, of your real food. How do you get your customers to take nice pictures? Because <laughs> right. not so, all of them look really good after. Yeah, so so what I do is I, I push the hashtag. So I push the hashtag. That's why I'm always dropping hashtag deep fried watermelon. The actual company in the U.S. is called hashtag deep fried watermelon. 
And I remember my lawyer was like, I don't think you can add a hashtag for the name of your LLC. And I was like, just submit it and see what happens. And it went through. So my company's actually the hashtag. Like that's the, the legal name, hashtag DeFi Watermelon. Wow. So what I do is I tell them, hey, when you, when you, they love to take pictures of it. And one of the things you do is you create an Instagram station, like have a station at your actual place. Have either your sign, it has a place for them to actually hold it up next to the sign. So you get, you create the staging for them to take the pictures right in front of you. And then when they do it, you go, remember hashtag deep fried watermelon. And then, you know, and I'll add your picture to my, my um, Instagram or my Facebook. And then it's like reverse, it's like reverse psychology. Cause now they want you to put it on their website. So they actually become your photographers. So other, other than being like, Hey, can you do that? They're like, Hey, if you do that and you hashtag it, maybe I'll put you on my website. And then they're like, Oh, okay. So you completely flip the paradigm. Um, also what I do is I, a lot of, we have a lot of time now, but you find black media, black media and black food entrepreneurship is sort of a match made in heaven, but we don't make that connection. I spend a lot of my time going online and finding bloggers, bloggers and being like, Hey, I'd like, I give you a free meal. If you come uh, just check me out. So yeah. you start in, you start giving them content. They come and sometimes you don't even have to give them a free meal, but you give them a free meal and get their honest reviews. And then now they're marketing for you for free of charge because they're star for content and then you're star for marketing. So you can actually just sort of put the two pieces together. And it works. And then, I'm sorry, Tanisha, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, because you have no absolute control over the type of photos, even with the beautiful props, we have a nice step and repeat banner, um, but you still want that content. I would just say you do have to just carve out that little time. I know how busy we get, but um, you're, you're, you have control over your presence on, um, on your Instagram pages and your Facebook pages. And so I think, you know, that is the part that's going to pull people in, um, putting those pictures on Google, Instagram, and Facebook. And like you said, those partnerships with bloggers or, you know, when you donate a meal and now people, um, you know, you're building partnerships and that's what we're doing. We're building relationships and you'll be surprised at just people who will come out and take a, a great picture and, and tell a great story. But I do think we do have to spend a little time taking those pictures as well. And I will say this, you know, as the podcaster in the room, um, there's a couple of things that you can do that won't cost an arm and a leg, but could be beneficial. One of them that I'm actually about to buy is like a light box. So you may have seen the ads for it on Instagram. It's just a little white box and it's light. You sit your plate in there. That means you get a really nice, solid background. It's very clean um, and it's beautiful lighting. So you could just literally just take an iPhone put your plate in that box, take the picture, post it, boom. So he, he got his right there. It's just a very simple little box. You could even probably go on YouTube and figure out how to make your own box if you don't want to order it. I think it costs no more than like 40 bucks maybe. Um, and I want just- the Dollar Tree. I literally, I'll get the, the phone boards. I'll get four of them um, and prop, well, three of them, put one at the bottom prop the other two have a backdrop and it really is all about the lighting if you can get something white and put your plate it really nicely and you may do that once a week and just take um i know our marketing person she actually um we we laid out all of the different packages and everything and we were able to actually put it down and make some really nice photos and, you know, once you do it that one time, you don't have to do it every time you make popcorn or every time you make deep fried watermelon or every time you do the chicken wontons, which I still want. Uh, once you have that photo, you can continue to use that over and over again and just find different filters or different ways that you are promoting it and whether it's flyers or whatever the case may be. But you don't necessarily have to always worry about doing it time and time again because once you got that photo you got it and you know you might put it with like some wontons here next to some kool-aid or you might have the wontons by themselves but there are a lot of different ways that you can use that and just take it that one good week um one thing that i need to do and i would encourage uh food entrepreneurs whenever you can because i understand life is real is have a content calendar 
you know, um, this is going to be one day that I'm going to sit down. And it, it doesn't have to be long. Like, it really doesn't have to be. Like, I think 30 minutes sometime is plenty and more than enough to sit down and say, hey, Mondays, I'm going to, it's menu Monday. So I'm, you know, laying out my things here. Um, Thirsty uh, Tuesdays or Thirsty Thursdays, I'm going to, you know, debut this drink. Or, you know, we popping on Saturdays and, you know, where's Miss Poppy going to be? And you already know I'm going to post that on Saturday. So my followers already know for the rest of the week where I'm going to be. So when it comes down to branding, you kind of want to treat your branding the way that you're treating your food. Like you have prep time for your food and then you have the time where you actually, you know, getting it done. You want to treat your content the same way. I have, and I'm actually going to sit down on Instagram live um, next week or the week after. And I'm going to talk about all the things that I wish I saw more food truckers do because I'm a food truck foodie. So we're going to talk about that. Um, and one of the things that I wish they would do was, even if you're not always consistent, at least be recent. I've seen some that haven't posted in months. Not great. I've seen some people that say, oh, I'm going to be here to this time. And they're not. Uh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to track you down to find you all the live long day. Thankfully, we have Eat Okra that is going to know where you are if you get listed with them. But you do want to take that time and put some effort in um, to do your branding because that's how people do I agree with that, Ariel. I say, you know, and they say that in every small business. I mean, since I have started this business, I have taken um, one year, once a year, I'm in like a small business development class. Um, I did the SBA Emerging Leaders Program. That was eight months. And I know we get so wrapped up because it's life. I mean, you heard my kids. I had to put the, take the camera off because they're like, we need some cups. We're outside. But, but, you know, at the end of the day, we have to take the time to work on our business and not just in our business because you did not leave your corporate job to just be an employee. And that is what will continue to happen if you don't take that time out to, to restructure yourself like Frederick has done to be able to hire 12 people to make sure you're managing them in the process because adding people, it sounds great, but it can be a headache if we haven't put the structures in place, the systems in place. And it's always ongoing. Obviously you have to tweak it. I mean, even the, mo the five, Fortune 500 companies haven't perfected that, but you have to take that time out to say, what is my marketing strategy? Do I have content? How am I communicating with my customers? That is the most um, egregious thing to go somewhere and it's like oh man they were supposed to be here or when you sell out hey we sold out I mean you got to do that as soon as you know you sold out so people aren't driving mean, because it is all a part of their experience you know and if it had they'll forgive you if it happens once or twice but you can't take their forgiveness for granted because they can then become frustrated with how we do things and so I think um, just taking that little time outside of our arts and our craft of what we the, the part of it that you love is to say you know how can I streamline this how do I have the information that's relevant the 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 nice shiny pictures so that I can continue to grow my my customer um base you know so those are some really good points yeah, yeah. I just want to say since we I, I want to thank all of you who hung on for the additional 19 minutes I thank you for giving me that extra time. We want to continue this conversation going. So I want to make sure that, A, that you're following everybody on social media. So make sure that you're following Eat Okra, the app on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook, all the platforms, and that you're downloading their app. If you're in a city and you're like, hey, I want to see my food truck. I want to see uh, my business, my restaurant listed. By all means, please add it. They're trying their best and to get as many as possible. And I absolutely love all the work that they're doing. I'm so grateful to Anthony and Josh um, for everything that they're doing. So please, that's right. Get like Tanisha, follow them, follow them, follow them, please. Follow the Food Truck Scholar on all social media platforms. Subscribe to our podcast. If you like the stories and the wisdom that everybody here is sharing, well, I got about 45 episodes that's already released. And I, my episode with Tanisha is coming out on Monday. So you want to know more about this popcorn, this jalapeno popper, and all these mm -hmm. other flavors that she got, connect with us. Follow Naughty But Nice 
on all platforms. Make sure you follow Maryland Chicken. If you're going to go to Philippines, can you stuff me in your suitcase so that <laughs> <laughs> I'll pay the baggage fee? I ain't paying nothing else. But can you yeah. let we, we, we come to the U.S. in the fall? Okay, you come in the fall. Okay. Yes. Okay. Well, not this fall, but previous last two years. We'll, we'll figure it out. We'll figure something out. Maryland Chicken with an A, right? There you. Thank you. <laughs> so make sure you're following them. And last but certainly not least, Trey is Rolling Cafe. I want my wontons. I want my chicken. <laughs> like what people don't know is that I actually went to Chris's house last year and she made this spread of all this different food that she can cook. And yes, yes, there we go. There we go. There's her sons, Trey and Pay, And she made us these pineapple boats to go that were just absolutely amazing. It was, she has spoiled my mother. She can do my eyes. Thank you. So please, 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 if you check the chat box, y'all, there is a link to join the Facebook group so that we can learn from each other and we can get some information because we can't cover it all today, but I believe that today is the start of a conversation. So please, um, thank you so much. I really do appreciate y'all who have been rocking with us for all three of the webinars. It's our first time doing this. So we got some kinks, but we learned and I'm so, so, so thankful for all of our guests who have been a part of this. And thank you for everybody who asked a question. So until then, you know what you got to do. You got to download that app for Eat Okra, listen to the Food Truck Scholar, and follow all of these folks here because they are amazing. And I'll see you in these Instagram streets, all right? All right, guys. Keep it popping. Nice to meet bye you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Nice bye to watermelon. <laughs> hey, Pay is Rolling Cafe, Mobile, Alabama. I'm still repping Birmingham all day. Uh-huh. <laughs> All right, yeah. Thank you. Bye. So